I would see the destruction of these currencies probably within the next year to 18 months or probably two years at the outside. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. Is it really possible that the world's major fiat currencies could be replaced soon, perhaps by a hard asset backed solution? Today's guest expert, Alistair McLeod, believes so, having made the case on this channel a few months back. We check in with Alistair here to see how developments since his last appearance are affecting his outlook, as well as to hear his latest price predictions for the price action for gold and silver. Alistair, thanks so much for returning to the program all the way over from the UK. That's my pleasure, Adam. All right. Well, uh, so I want to get to the building on the discussion we had last time when you were on a few months back, Alistair. But before we do, let me just ask at a very high level. What's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets right now? I think the most important thing is something which very, very few people understand, and that is the cycle of bank credit. We are in a situation where um, the major banks are very highly leveraged. And when that happens and things start deteriorating in terms of the outlook as far as bankers are concerned, then they start contracting their balance sheets. Now, the reason this matters is that um, GDP is actually the it's just driven by bank credit. It is the spending of bank credit. The amount of cash spend, which because you've got two elements of credit in the economy in terms of circulating media, you've got uh, dollar notes and coin, which are token coin. They're not real. <laughs> they're not real coins. And you've got um, bank credit. And um, if you take out the overseas portion, and funnily enough, I was looking at the numbers this morning. Um, you can pretty much halve the level of of uh, cash notes on the on the Fed's balance sheet as liabilities to arrive at a cash figure for the domestic U.S. economy. Now, that being the case, then five percent of it is cash. Ninety five percent of it is bank credit. So what happens when you get a contraction of bank credit? GDP contracts now. Bank credit feeds not just GDP, but it also feeds the financial sector, the um, exchange of financial assets, the um, ability to hold on to financial assets. It's so it does two very, very important things. But if we concentrate on the GDP, for, uh, sorry, on yeah, on GDP for the moment, a contraction in bank credit to take them back to more normal times, I think means that it should, in theory, mean that GDP contracts by something like four, five, maybe six trillion dollars. Now that's a massive hit. That's a massive hit. And that is without anything happening from abroad because we've got systemic risks from abroad as well. So um, I think it's terribly important to understand what this GDP number is. It is not um, a reflection of um, uh, economic performance, economic prospects, um, economic progress, whatever the Keynesians and the macroeconomists um, uh, believe. It's not that, it is actually just the sum total of transactions funded through bank credit. And if you get a contraction of bank credit, you're gonna get a contraction of nominal GDP, which if it doesn't match, because it, it won't match because it is also contracting um, uh, the financial sector. So, that I think is the most important thing to understand. And what it means is that the slide in GDP, which we're only just beginning to see, is gonna be considerably uh, worse than anybody expects. This is very, very important. And you can only really understand it if you understand the psychology of bankers. When bankers um, are confident about the economic outlook, they leverage up their balance sheets. And you, you can get um, uh, the balance sheet leverage in terms of assets to equity, you know, balance sheet equity, moving, say, up from something like eight to 10 times to 10 to 12 times, that sort of move. The average of the global systemically important banks, and I think there are eight of them in the, in the United States, uh, is around about 11.7 times. I think the most leveraged is Goldman Sachs, run about 13 times. Um, I think one of the least leveraged ones from memory is um, uh, Wells Fargo. I mean, 
they've, they've been told to restrict their business so they're not quite as lever lever le leveraged as the others. Um, so you can see that um, to get back to that, say, you know, seven to eight times, um, there's a lot of bank credit got to be destroyed, which will be reflected in deposits on the deposit side of their balance sheets, which will reduce outstanding deposits very significantly. And we're talking about trillions, and that is going to be the impact on GDP. I'm sure we can talk about the financial effect um, separate to that, but that probably raises a few questions for you. <laughs> it does, because those are big, big numbers. Um, so just to put this in, in context for folks, uh, Alistair was just mentioning there he's expecting potentially a four to six trillion contraction in GDP. GDP is about 25 trillion. So that's about a 20% contraction in GDP that you're contemplating there, Alistair. That, that would be pretty... Uh, Painful, I think, is way too much of an understatement <laughs> to use. Yeah. Um, so let's let's. So you you started this by saying this is you know you get to know where we are in the cycle of bank credit here. So if we're entering the down cycle where bankers are becoming more nervous and therefore they're tightening uh, their lending, which is going to lead to this contraction that you're talking about. Can you just explain for a moment what is driving this part of the cycle? What what is it specifically that is making the bankers? scared enough to, to tighten by this much? Is it is it just the Fed raising the cost of capital right now with its rate hikes or, or what is it? No, it's 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 actually very, very simple. And to understand it, you've just got to imagine that you're you're a director of a bank and that you have responsibility to shareholders in that in that context. Um, you see interest rates beginning to rise. Now um, we've got a huge great gap between where interest rates are and arguably where they should be, because you've got um, inflation running at 10% or, you know, CPI inflation. Some say more, some say it's CPI, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's a huge gap. And that's going to have to be closed somewhat. Maybe not totally, but closed somewhat. Now, imagine that you're a director of a bank and you have got uh, loans out to businesses in this environment. And you know that quite a number of the businesses which you have lent money to cannot handle higher interest rates because they are we well we i mean we could be really blunt and say that they're zombie companies which you've been keeping going because you didn't want to write off <laughs> your loans um they could be merely businesses which um in better times thrive but when they get a a drop in 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 sales um then immediately uh, they had start running into overdrafts so um when it comes to um you know that sort of liquidity money uh, do you really want to provide liquidity into an economy which you can see is beginning to turn down because interest rates are going up the answer is no uh, and um the, the other thing is that uh, quite a lot of your activities, and particularly since uh, the 1980s, have um, uh, been increasing in the financial sphere. So uh, you've got a lot of exposure to financial assets, rising interest rates. What does it do to their values? So that's another area which you're probably going to try and cut back on. Um, so all told, I mean, you know, this is a time to be very nervous. And um, if you uh, um, were caught, let us say, with COVID, and of course, I mean, COVID completely unexpected, what happened, everybody, um, their sales stopped, their cost continued. So um, their, you know, their borrowing increased. So, um, you know, you, you, you suddenly find that you are over leveraged in a market, which suddenly is beginning to decline. Now that for a banker is a frightening position to be in. So what do you do as a director of the bank? You want to cut back as much as you can. And the thing that was interesting, and I, I can't remember whether this came up um, the last time we spoke, but Jamie Dimon um, spoke at a banking conference. I think it was in the very early days of uh, July uh, in New York. And um, he said that two weeks ago, I likened the economy to uh, being in a storm. I've upgraded that now. As far as I'm concerned, we are in a hurricane. Now, that is the most senior commercial banker in the world giving you a heads up that he is going to start contracting his balance sheet. 
do not ignore that. And nor will all the cohort of bankers around the world. They will know exactly what he said. And if they hadn't already arrived at the same conclusion themselves, they have been told by da Jamie Dimon that this situation is getting worse. Therefore, contract your balance sheets. It is inevitable. And this is the cycle of bank credit. I mean, you know, we've had this um, ever since records really began. Um, it was particularly violent in the first uh, half of the 19th century. It smoothed out a bit after the, um, uh, the, the, the 1844 Bank Charter Act, uh, which was a major piece of legislation. Um, and uh, of course, this is the thing which led to the post-war slump. Uh, it led to the 1930s. I mean, this happens every 10 years on average. And we are now, what, 13, 14 years since the last um, slump the last uh, bank credit cycle downturn, which um, was essentially financial in nature, and uh, that was that led to the Lehman failure. So, you know, it's time we had another one, I'm afraid. And if you are a director of a bank, you will be very aware of all these dynamics and you will feel very, very exposed. And furthermore, where you have counterparty risk to the Eurozone and the Japanese um, financial markets, you will know that there, um, your counterparties in those markets are even more highly leveraged than you are. I mean, it's an average of the G, the GSIBs average in the Eurozone is around about 20 times. The average in, um, uh, in Japan is around about 21, 22 times. So, you know, I mean, it's just incredible the leverage in these foreign banks. And that's where the failure is likely to come from first. So what do you do? I mean, when it comes to everything, you just want to just batten down the hatches and to hell with it. You know? <laughs> if you're going to, you know, just get get your loans in as much as you can, cut your deposit base as much as you can, reduce that uh, ratio of balance sheet assets to uh, equity and protect your shareholders. All right. So so on that, and, and I just want to mention another recent quote by Jamie Dimon, uh, which which adds further weight to what you're saying, um, he's recently said that, quote, something worse than a recession may be on its way here, right? So he's he's talked about the economic hurricane. He's now saying we should all be really concerned about a recession coming, but but maybe even something worse than that. Um, so given that level of pessimism, that, that more level of storm alert, uh, alert warning, um, are we beginning to see in the actual data um, these deleveraging steps on behalf of the banks? Is, is, that, is that already beginning to appear in the data that you monitor? It's, it's only really evident in um, the uh, slowing down of the growth. I'm, I'm talking sort of worldwide rather than specifically, the slowing down yeah. in the growth of broad money supply, which is comprised basically of bank credit and everything which is slightly more liquid. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, yes, we are seeing signs of it slowing down, but we haven't yet really got the signs that this is really going to crash. Um, but I have no doubt that in my own mind that that is the direction in which it's going. And I was interesting you quoting that um, other um, statement from Jamie Dimon about um, you know, this could be a bit worse than recession. Um, what your viewers may not know is that following his hurricane um, uh, comment, um, his chief economist came out and um, said uh, to the contrary that um, they, the bank did not expect things to deteriorate. I can't remember the word, but um, basically what he was doing was he was rowing back on his boss's statement. My guess is that the Fed, to, you know, so I thought, oh, shock, horror. We can't have Jamie saying this. Right. This is going to you know, this is going to kill us all. For God's sake, get out of the bank and get them to issue a denial. And I think that was the denial. That was the the thing. So what he's now saying is not hurricane. He's saying recession. He's had his knuckles wrapped by the Fed. I feel pretty sure of that because they're going to be very, very sensitive to this sort of thing. I guess so. But, you know, when your brain says what's worse than a recession, you know, then it pretty quickly goes to depression, which is something I don't think the Fed wants people worrying about right now, too. <laughs> but but we'll see. So real quick, you know, um, so you would think that banks would would tighten lending policies, mean, mean meaning they'd be letting fewer loans, they'd be making fewer loans right now, given their concerns. You would think they would probably be trying to call any loans that they could, right, yeah. just they're not having them out there. 
um, I guess this is the type of behavior that you're expecting to see a lot more of over the coming months, correct? Yes, that's that's absolutely correct. In fact, you can see it already in um, uh, the is figures issued by NASDAQ on uh, margin debt um, for financing financial positions or f positions in financial assets. I mean, that has been contracting very sharply in, in recent months. Um, so it is already happening in that sphere. And that okay. doesn't and, surprise and, and, me. Sorry to interrupt on that, but, but it, it, that could contract for two reasons. It could contract because people just don't want to make margin loans anymore because they're becoming less speculative. My guess is, don't let me put words in your mouth, but but I would think you and I do too. I don't think speculation has flushed out of the market as much as, 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 as that it would cause a downturn in that because we're still having things like yeah. what happened at Bed Bath & Beyond this past week. I mean, the speculative money is still out there. So the other way that it comes down is the banks are just willing to make less margin loans. And so the old ones roll off. And since no new ones are being made, the margin loan balance starts coming down. So it's probably more like that. Is that what you think? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's really sort of understanding, um, you know, what makes people um, reduce their, their loan positions. I mean, basically, when you've got a really frothy market and everybody's bullish, it's not um, the people taking profits because actually their psychology is we want more. Right. So, um, you know, inevitably what happens uh, at the top of a market like that when the loan books start contracting is that it is the banks driving it, not the punters. And um, I mean, obviously, it's not a pure argument. I mean, there's a bit of both, obviously. But uh, I would say that overwhelmingly, the banks, um, the brokers would be pulling in loans rather than... Um, uh, the reverse and like you know so so when you see um you know sort of positions beginning to go sour i think that they would tend to act very very quickly on the margin in order to try and close positions down so and and uh, i mean I, it's 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 an interesting um question because we tend to think of margin loans only really be being on the bull tack but we do know that um, hedge funds have been shorting it and have recently been squeezed, which is why, why the uh, equity market has been so strong in, in the last month or six weeks. So, uh, you know, either way creates a loan situation which would be reflected in the NASDAQ figures. Okay. So, you know, in the, in the world up until just now, uh, the, the regular mindset would be, um, Okay, banks are getting nervous. They're going to start tightening, um, and and maybe there's a danger of GDP contracting. But don't worry, because the Fed is just going to step in, and the other major central banks, and they're just going to start flooding the world with stimulus again. I assume inflation is the big differentiator this time around. That they just can't step in and do that while we have near double digit CPI. Is that the big limiter here? Um, it's a, that's a very good question. Um, We'll know the answer once uh, events um, evolve. Um, but because the Fed's mandate basically is to try and maintain, as one of its two mandates, reasonably full employment, and because undoubtedly the government doesn't want to see um, a slump, a recession, whatever we call it, then any severe contraction in the in bank credit is bound to be met by... Um, uh, if you like, um, raw currency being injected into in, into the economy. Now, I would guess that the easy way for the Fed to do that would be through financing um, an increased uh, budget deficit. So I would see um, uh, government programs to support the economy, if you like, you know, all that sort of rubbish, because they, they really don't, they, they can't actually make the decision what is worth supporting and what isn't, because it's mm -hmm. a commercial decision. They're not in a position to make commercial decisions. But I think that's the way in which it would happen. So um, instead of quantitative tightening, I think that would very rapidly be replaced by quantitative easing, uh, because they will want to maintain a constant level of money, currency, if you like, um, credit, uh, which is GDP. And uh, one way to do that is 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 to uh, get the government to effectively increase its spending, which, of course, it can finance through QE or um, it can finance in terms of short term debt, which investing institutions will still be very happy to buy because they see it as a safe haven. All right. But let's Let's just look at your country that you're in right now, the UK, right? So right now, inflation, I Last think, week. is what? <laughs> yeah. 
I think CPI there is 10.1% right now, right? And just this morning, uh, there was a city report that came out where the analyst was predicting 18% CPI by January in the UK. And that's under current status quo conditions, right? Where, where rates are being hiked. So uh, let's say the rest of the year, the wheels really start to come off. GDP starts contracting. Um, maybe CPI comes down a tiny bit, but then you then you, then you have the, the banks stepping in to try to fill this massive hole that you just mentioned might be opening up beneath them. What yeah. happens to the CPI in in the UK if it's already starting at like, say, 15% when the next yeah. wave of, of stimulus goes out? Well, I mean, they have got a hell of a problem. I mean, they set all this off basically by, um, you know, massive deficit spending on the back of COVID. COVID was the excuse, if you like. Um, but now we have a situation where the um, the Bank of England um, has completely misjudged um, the inflationary effects of the price level of all this money printing. As indeed, I mean, you've got a cohort of central bankers. They meet at the Bank of International Settlements every two months. They stay in contact with each other. They are in a group think. Every major central bank made exactly the same mistake. And if you look at the um, statistics that they put out, their expectations, they're all going back to 2% inflation, you know, except instead of it being at the beginning of 2023, it's going to be in the beginning of 2024 or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is, a, this is a groupthink problem. It's not just the UK. We've got it in spades. Um, we have got it in spades partly because we are next door to Europe, which... <laughs> Is, is another level of risk entirely. I mean, it really is. Um, and uh, when you look at um, the, if you like, the policy problem that the, the, the Bank of England faces, it's only got two um, weapons in its armory. One is interest rates. And I can tell you that interest rates have got nothing to do with managing the quantity of money. And the second one is the quantity of money, which it manages through quantitative easing a lot more than it manages through quantitative tightening. We haven't, we've, we've seen a tiny bit of quantitative tightening with a few bonds running off the book, you know, maturing. And, and I think the Bank of England sold some, uh, a few, you know, sort of small amount of corporate bonds into the market, but that's about it. I mean, basically they can only go one way and that is reduce interest rates and print debt. That is, that, those are, that's all it's got in its, in, in its armory. We now have a situation which is calling against that. It's got to raise interest rates. Why? Not because interest rates control the rate of money, but by, for the very simple reason that what an interest rate is, is it is compensation for the, the loss of possession of money, one. In other words, you give it to someone else, like a bank, mm -hmm. so it's no longer in your possession. It is loss of purchasing power over the period which um, you part with your money. Um, and also, lastly, it is the risk that you entail by giving it to someone else that you're not actually going to get it back. That is what it's about. It's not the price of money as far as the depositor is concerned. So while the situation continues, we will have sterling under pressure. And today we see um, the sterling dollar rate go down to 1.1750. I mean, this is a new low for the last God knows how many years. Um, I think I think it went slightly lower in the in the Brexit um, situation. But you know, post Brexit, we had a wonderful rally. We went up to one forty, and now we have lost a good twenty percent of um, value in the sterling. Sterling is not alone in this. Um, it is also true of the yen, and it's also true true of the euro. And you will have seen that uh, the dollar's trade weighted has been remarkably strong. It's not because the dollar is strong. It's just it is measured against crappy currencies. Right. And I'm afraid sterling is one of them. And it's because the Bank of England has got itself into this situation where it cannot raise interest rates sufficiently to stop the currency sliding. So that's where we are. Um, and um, when it comes to the rate of inflation, I mean, the retail price index is already up something like 13 percent. So. You know, the CPI actually doesn't capture the whole story at all. And we have got all the other problems. I mean, we're beginning to see mortgage rates rise, which is beginning to impact on house prices, which um, is extremely unhelpful in terms of um, stimulating the consumer. That is for sure. 
Right. <laughs> um, we've also got another problem, and that is London is the financial center, ex-New York, for the rest of the world. And particularly, uh, we clear pretty much all the um, uh, interbank uh, euro transactions for the commercial banking network, not, not the, the, the central banking network, the euro system. Um, and uh, that's all done through London, which basically means that London has all the Eurozone uh, commercial banks as its counterparties. It also has uh, the Japanese banks. It also has quite a lot of the American banks. But London has a huge, great problem insofar as this financial whirlwind to which the world is now exposed is likely to center on London. So I'm not help, hopeful really for the immediate outlook in London. I think it's, um, we've got a number of factors which actually could be really rather nasty for us here. Mm, well, so um, the reason why I asked that question and I'll, I'll dig into it just a, a little bit further here, which is in the past, and you know, we just saw this response uh, during the, the pandemic, um, the central banks would just ratchet it up and do more to try to fill whatever hole is opening up there. Um, but this time around, with with CPI being as high as it is, and as you're saying, it probably even understates the real experience of the the daily lived yep. you know experience of the regular consumer. Will there be limits to that? Right. In other words, um, you know, could could, could the, the 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 cost of living rise so far so sharply so much so quickly from here and it's already starting from a very high base that the public starts really pushing back and saying you know we'll almost take the slowdown in the economy than we will you know our electricity and food costs jumping by double digits every year um i don't think that's an option in front of the public the public have to deal with what they're given i think um where we go from here it's, I mean, there the, are the two aspects. I'll deal with the easy one first, and that is that um, President Putin is not done in the Ukraine. He's not done putting the squeeze on Europe. And that means that in this winter, it's going to be very, very tough in Europe. It's mm -hmm. going to be very tough in this country. Um, you're going to have a combination of lack of fuel and lack of food. And that's not a nice combination in the middle of the winter. It's bad enough now, let alone in, in, in winter. So I would see energy prices higher um in the winter and i'd also see food price inflation continuing and so that's the background against which monetary policy has to be managed i mean you know <laughs> i'd rather they didn't manage it but the, you know we live in a world where central banks try and manage these things so that that is really um what they face um i think that um it's going i mean it is going to be incredibly tough but the, and the second the second thing is the question as to what value does the average person place on uh, currency relative to goods? And this is a point which was made um, by Ludwig von Mises very much against the uh, monetarist approach uh, to um, the relationship between money and prices. Um, as I'm sure most of your viewers will know, um, the relationship as far as monetarists are concerned is that if you increase the quantity of money, you decrease its purchasing power. And, um, you know, it should sort of happen maybe with a bit of a time lag, but um, it is a proportional um, uh, thing. So if you double the quantity of money, you sort of roughly halve its purchasing power. Um, there is obviously some truth in uh, the relationship between the quantity of money and its purchasing power. But by far the bigger determinant is the use which the public um, uh, put uh, on that money in terms of its use value. So um, to give you an example, if they decide to dump the currency completely in return for goods and services, then it becomes completely worthless, despite uh, um, uh, you know the changes in the quantity which may of money which may or may not happen, and I think that at some stage we are likely to see um, this played out in in um, in quite dramatic form. Uh, and the reason I say that is that when you get a, a very severe um, contraction of bank credit, it inevitably leads to banking failures. It is the job of a central bank to try and ensure that these banking failures do not happen and they do not impact on members of the public. 
So what you're going to see is you're going to see the currencies being debauched um, in order to protect uh, the financial system, if I can put it like, that way. Hmm. Uh, and I've, you know, I've, I've said this so many times until I'm blue in the face. The, the um, uh, prime example of this was John Law in 1720 France, when he printed credit in order to buy shares, support shares in his Mississippi venture. Um, and it got to the stage where um, it no longer began to work. Um, the shares sank despite that. But what happened was that he destroyed the currency in the process. And we have a similar situation today where the central banks will try and keep the whole of the financial system going, which basically is not just keeping the banks open for business, but also stopping financial assets from sliding in value. And now that's going to require enough money printing to either destroy the currencies through quantity alone, or more likely, destroy the credibility of the fiat currencies that they issue in order to try and support markets. And that, I think, is really where we're going with this. All right. So if I can just tack on to that, which is if the, if, if the currency is being debauched, that basically means that the CPI is going up anyways, because yeah. it's a, reflecting the loss of purchasing awesome. power. So obviously, the, the, cons the consumer, the public is going to notice that. And if they're in an environment where key essentials like fuel and food are, are in shorter supply, then it you would expect you know what we've seen in a lot of other countries, let's just take in Argentina mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, where people will just rush out when they get paid to exchange that paper for those key limited supplies, which basically just you know continues yes. the cycle of the the, yeah. the hyperinflation, right? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Now I think that's a, um, uh, you, you've got it right. And uh, I think in the um, South American context, I think we probably see a better example with Venezuela which has got the greatest oil reserves in the world. <laughs> and, you know, guess what? <laughs> um, they've destroyed their currency. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, you don't need necessarily to be a terribly, um, you know, I mean, you, you don't get protection from being a very well-off country from uh, the destruction of wealth that um, modern macroeconomics can, can, can wreak. All right. So the last time you were on this program four months ago, Alistair, um, we talked about what was going on, you know, the the sort of seismic shockwaves that the Ukraine invasion, which was still relatively mm -hmm. new back when we talked, uh, what the implication of those shockwaves was going to be. And you had said that you thought that it was accelerating the evolution of a new monetary system um, away from just pure fiat currencies towards some new system that was probably likely going to be commodity backed from everything you're saying here right now it sounds like the acceleration of the purchasing power debauchery in the major fiat currencies you see is is it's game on from here yeah. on um i guess it's been four months since we last talked to you you're you're seeing these developments that we've just been talking about here uh do you still think it's headed towards some sort of new replacement monetary system and one that does have a hard asset backing Yes, I do. Um, we've seen um, I, when when I last spoke to you. I think it was at about that time that it was it was evident that um, a core of nations within uh, Asia, and this was the Eurasian economic area, which is really comprised of Belarus and various stands in the middle. Um, uh, you know, sort of between China and Russia also including Russia and China, were trying to set up a currency which would be used for trade settlement purposes only rather than circulating um, alongside national currencies. Um, we haven't heard anything more on that, but it is, it is clear the way the geopolitical situation is evolving that um, that plan is not dead um, and they are evolving towards that direction. I mean, the, the interesting thing is that the, um, the whole of the, um, if you like, an alternative uh, um, uh, geopolitical entity compared with the American and NATO-led political entities with which we are more familiar. And if you look at the populations involved, I, I think in rough terms, I 
uh, America and its allies. Uh, if you look at the Asian bloc, it works out about 57% of the global population. So they're already sort of more or less twice the size of us in terms of people. Now, in the old days, we wouldn't have worried about this because, um, you know, impoverished nomads uh, who don't really figure in the economy. So what? Who cares? But actually, things have changed hugely in, um, in Asia. Um, you've got communications which are being set up, that's developing. Those economies are in an industrial revolution, which is ongoing, despite the problems we see in China in the property sector. That is still, it's still ongoing. Um, and we even see that um, one of the two founding part partners of the, um, uh, of the petrodollar, Saudi Arabia, the other one obviously being America, but Saudi Arabia is now flirting with the idea of joining BRICS. And I have known for some time that in terms of long-term strategic planning, the Arab world have increasingly taken the view that their future is with Asia and not with America and Europe. And apart from anything else, I mean, we're pursuing this um, decarbonization um, thing um, very aggressively. So that sends a signal to all the hydrocarbon producers right. that their future is not with us. So you can see that, you know, the world has gone into two lumps. There is us, you know, and we're relying on our financial markets, if you like. To, to drive things. And you've got a commodity driven block, which is at least twice the size of us, centered on Asia, Asia. and also incorporating the whole of um, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, certain countries in, 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 uh, um, uh, in South America as well. I mean, this is, this, is, this is enormous, it's far bigger than us. And these guys are all commodity driven and they will seek protection from a collapse in our currencies by tying their currencies somehow towards in, in, into their commoditized or the commodity driven economies. So whether they go on a gold standard or whatever um, in the fullness of time, um, I don't know, we'll have to see. I mean, I just noticed there is a marked reluctance of every central bank in the world to part with any gold whatsoever. They mm -hmm. seem it's, it's all right for them, but it's not all right for us. So you know, that I think um, is a development which we will have to see closer to the time. But Meanwhile, um, the research that I have done has shown quite clearly that when you look at the volatility in commodity prices and you compare the volatility in fiat currencies, which obviously what we watch, we watch the dollar price of copper, for example, dollar price of oil, um, compare it with the gold price for copper oil, whatever it is. I mean, it's been very, very stable in gold terms. All the volatility is actually in the fiat currencies which is completely the other way around from um, where we think. We think that actually it's the copper price being volatile or the oil price being volatile. It's not. It's our currency. It's our currency against those individual uh, commodities. I mean, you know, the times when the price of oil will move faster than the price of copper or faster than the price of lithium or fast, whatever, it doesn't matter because it's a question of allocation where the currency goes. But the volatility is in the currency, and that needs to be thought about very, very deeply. It actually destroys the whole concept of trying to run an economy on a fiat currency. It's a fascinating conclusion. That is. All right. Well, look, I want to I want to get to your specific thoughts on the precious metals in just a moment, because that's your sort of your day job is really focusing on those markets. Um, and there's lots of implications about what's happening with those fiat currencies as it relates to the precious metals. But but real quickly, um, in talking about this, this, you know, emergence of a more polarized world, it's amazing how much of this sort of, you know, happy goodwill of globalization has been unraveled just in 2022 alone. Yeah. Um, but when we talked last, you had said that, if I remember correctly, that you think that that a, a part of uh, Putin's long term strategy, especially going into Ukraine, uh, is to really start to drive a wedge between the U.S., Europe and the U.S., right? Yeah. It's to put enough pressure on the on Europe that Europe says, you know what, maybe we're actually better off having even stronger ties with Russia and perhaps this emerging bloc yeah. and, and not being as tied to America as we have been in the past. So it's even though it's it's 
this Eurasian bloc in the West, you know, Putin might be trying to actually carve the West in two, right? Um, and clearly, it's got, pardon my French here, but it, it's got Europe by the short hairs right now. Um, and looking forward into winter, you just painted a pretty grim grim outlook. And I've talked to a couple of other experts such as yourself over the past couple of weeks who are European based, and they are quite pessimistic as well. I mean, honestly, beyond sort of hoping for a coup in Russia, it doesn't seem that Europe has a lot of short term optimism about being able to get out from under its you know, near total energy dependency on Russia right now. So um, I guess my question is, is do you still believe that that's the case? In other words, that uh, that, that Putin is trying to, to, to you know, lever apart uh, the U.S. In, in, in Europe. And what's your current estimation of his level of success at being able to do that, given, you know, the fact that Europe doesn't have many good near or maybe even midterm options here? Yeah, <laughs> my opinion on that hasn't changed at all. That's the first thing I'd say. And if anything, I would suggest that um, events have moved um, in such a way that they rather confirm that analysis. Um, I mean, right from the start, we have known that Putin did not want to see America anywhere near his Western borders. Um, and that plainly is the objective. I mean, it's not to win, you know, to completely take over the whole of Ukraine. I mean, you could say that he wants to, um, you know, consolidate his position in the Donetsk and so on, you know, on that sort of eastern end of the Ukraine. I can understand that. I mean, it's the Russian speakers and so on and so forth. Um, but actually, really what he wants to do is he just wants to get America out of Europe in terms of telling Europe what to do. Because in the longer term, um, Russia has the potential for enormous trade with Europe. It doesn't want to lose that. Uh, but, you know, the way in which it maintains it, the way in which it will pursue its objectives, getting uh, um, uh, America out of Europe, is basically to squeeze Europe. And that's what he's doing. And the squeeze is going to get <laughs> tougher and tougher and tougher. Um, it's interesting that, um, you know, on this energy thing, um, you know, he turned around and said, well, you can have as much energy as you like, but you'll have to pay in rubles. Um, that was the first thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but at, mm -hmm. at the same time, he turned around to um, his, you know, if you like, uh, his colleagues in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and indeed anyone else outside uh, this sort of American led um, hegemony. Uh, and said, we will take your currencies. He was quite happy to take, uh, you know, rubbish um, uh, currencies from Turkey, for example, or Iran or wherever it might be. Um, and we will exchange uh, oil or energy or, you know, commodities for those. Um, you know, and you sort of, and not only that, but he's been offering the oil out at a discount. So that this gives a huge, huge boost to... Uh, the relative uh, economic performance of um, greater Asia uh, than um, than we're getting out of this situation. I mean, you know, you can see that um, India, I mean, the, you know, it's a classic example. I mean, that, that economy needs uh, an awful lot of oil. OK, so it gets it very cheaply from Russia in return for rupees, which it just prints <laughs> or, or is issued as credit. I mean, what a wonderful deal. And he gets it at such a discount that he, he can even uh, process it and then repackage it and ship it to America. That right. was the latest thing, which, which I understand ha happened. Um, so, you know, we are definitely bifurcating into two separate worlds in terms of economy. And I'm afraid we're in the wrong one. And it's, it's entirely our fault. We've, we've fallen, if you like, for, uh, I mean, strategically, we blundered completely in, in mishandling Putin. And I mean, in the early days, there was so much um, desire for believing that Putin wouldn't succeed or, you know, he would back down and he would be forced to negotiate um, or he was ill. And people were telling me that, oh, we think he's got dementia or something, you know, uh, you know, come on. And the vested interests you see in the mainstream media of reporting uh, the Russian economy being in trouble. It's not in trouble. Um, it's actually probably in as good a condition as ever been. And certainly its trade surpluses are at record levels. So, so what's the problem in Russia? None whatsoever. They're actually enjoying this. 
Hmm. All right. I might want to dig into that in just a minute if we've got time. But but real quick, um, I know you're not a political analyst. You're you're economic and monetary analyst, but you do live in Europe. And uh, I'm curious if there has been any shift yet in terms of the leadership there in potentially developing an opening mindset to engaging with Putin and Russia to try to find a compromise versus, you know, demonizing him and saying, look, we're not going to have anything to do with these you know, with, with, with Russia and we're just going to put in, you know, boycotts and embargoes and whatnot. And in the UK, you guys are going through a transition in your prime minister. And so I'm just curious, is the incoming prime minister, is her mindset in any way different from the previous one? Or, or is it still, you know, very, very polarized uh, Russia bad, West good? It's still polarized Russia bad, West good. I mean, okay. Liz Truss, um is still the foreign secretary so you know she's she's been pushing the the russia bad thing as you may okay. imagine and rishi sunak the other contender um uh, similarly has been pushing the same thing and i think right. and europe, i'm sorry i i assume that she was going to win based on what i've heard in the polls <laughs> but i shouldn't do that we should let the election happen have some advanced information <laughs> <laughs> but i couldn't possibly comment on that um I, I think I think uh, around Europe as, as as a whole, I think there's still. I mean, the Putin is uh, the enemy. He is um, the source of all our troubles. Um, it is due to him that uh, we're suffering from uh, enormous um, gas and oil price hikes and so on and so forth. So he's definitely um, the evil man behind this. Um, the problems in Europe haven't evolved. Yes, I think to understand that that's not necessarily the case. And actually, the responsibility is the mismanagement of the situation by their own governments. I think that will happen at some stage in the future. But for now, what you're getting is you're getting uh, farmers, for example, in, 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 in the Netherlands, um, uh, revolting against the government's plans to um, decarbonize the economy. Um, and you've got similar, um, you know, problems throughout Europe. Um, you know, they're all revolting against government policy, their own government policy. They haven't yet started to look at the situation in that broader geopolitical sense. Though undoubtedly, I think that will happen. And I think the winter is going to be um, the time really when that, that happens, because people will then start accusing um, their own governments uh, for the situation, for that broader situation, rather than just blaming Putin. That's the shift I think that I would see happening. Okay, okay. So, so it sounds like um, we're, we're not seeing a thawing yet towards Russia, no. but it also, I don't put words in your mouth, it doesn't seem like uh, the populace in Europe is saying, hey, we need America less at this point. They're not, they're not. No. So, so no, they if, haven't... If, if Putin's goal is to separate Europe from America, that, that schism isn't visibly happening yet. No, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, in, in, in that context, I don't think anyone is talking about um, the uh, desire of Putin to get rid of America. And if America goes, then uh, most of our problems are going to go away. That is, I haven't seen anyone mention that other than me and you okay. talking about it. <laughs> okay. And, and presumably things like that, you know, don't happen overnight. That's, they take a long time. That's, that, that's, that's for the future. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, look, uh, last sort of geopolitical question, and we'll get to the medals. Um, so is there a chance? I mean, you, you've laid out why, um, you know, we're having this polarized uh, world evolve and there'll be a new economic potentially power, superpower, maybe eventually mm -hmm. of these resource based uh, economies. Um that said, you know, they're all not without their own challenges. You gave a quick nod to some of the issues that are going on in China right now. Um, you know, sure, India is benefiting from cheaper energy right now, which is, I'm sure, helping it. But, you know, India's got a lot of issues. And, and Russia, you're, you're positing that they might be doing quite well right now. I've heard other arguments that say, hey, you know, Russia's got a lot of longer term problems, too. They're not a perfect nation by any stretch. Is there a chance that we emerge from this? across the coming years where there really are kind of no winners from this, where almost every player is worse off in the end. I don't um, know. I'm just tossing it out there. Yeah, yeah, no, about. no, no. I, it's, it's, it's a very sensible question. Um, 
I mean, the way I've been looking at it is slightly differently. I think we're going to end up worse off than right. say the you know the the greater Asian bloc. Um, I mean, China has got exactly the same uh, cyclical bank credit problem. There is a difference, though, and that is that the big banks in China are all um, owned by the government or controlled by the government, so that they can actually, you know, because, because the executives in the banks are essentially functionaries rather than profit-seeking um, uh, directors or executives, um, then those banks will um, expand credit uh, if they're told to do so. So um, I can see that happening. I can see, I mean, we've already had, I think, in the last week or two, two cuts in in sort of fairly small cuts in interest rates in China to try and stop the slide in confidence in the property markets. Um, so yeah, they've got those problems. They've managed to avoid uh, the, the, the cyclicality of, of, of uh, bank credit, uh, basically because they control the banks. But you know, it's got to the stage where it's caught up with them. What I would say is that um, in the long term, there is the demand for property in China. Of that, I would have no doubt. It's just that the whole of the sort of supply and demand story has just got ahead of itself, uh, and it needs to, to, to pause. Um, China still has an awful lot to do in terms of putting an infrastructure around it. Um, it is, I mean, I saw um, that China has apparently forgiven loans to eight African countries, you know. Um, so it's in the business, I think, of ensuring that it stimulates or it doesn't destroy markets outside its own um, immediate domestic uh, sphere. And um, your comment about Russia, I mean, the thing that's interesting is that the people who think Russia is a, a, um, a dead duck tend to look at it in Keynesian terms. They actually don't understand that if the ruble goes from 150 to the current level of 59, which it has done in a matter of just three or four months, <laughs> that's not necessarily a bad thing. So, you know, they think this is, you know, this is shock, horror, ghastly, goes against all macroeconomic theory we've been taught. Um, the, I mean, I, the, the key thing to remember about Russia is that the um, level of taxation is extremely low. And that's actually very good for economic activity. They don't necessarily collect all the statistics which we salivate over about, you know, how the economy is doing and all the rest of it. But, you know, I mean, with with um, uh, the basic rate of income tax, a flat rate, I think, of 13 percent, you know, God, dream on. Wouldn't I like that? Right. <laughs> you know, that would encourage me to go out and do things. Um, and I mean, other taxes are relatively minor. Um, you could argue that it can afford this because it is such an exporter of commodities. I wouldn't argue against that. Um, but the finances, Russia's finances actually are pretty good. Um, and I would say that they're a lot better than the West. So again, you know, I mean, there's no such thing as a perfect government. I mean, in fact, the less government, the better, as far as I'm concerned. You do have that to an extent in Russia. If only they would uh, smarten up in terms of property rights. And if they'd smarten up against um, the state's um, propensity to um, remove um, people it doesn't like uh, through claiming that they owe tax or whatever, whatever. I mean, they destroy businesses. They're quite happy to destroy people and their businesses. That is not good. I mean, property rights should be respected. And that's one lesson that they haven't learned. But other than that, you know, I would say that Russia is in a far better position than many, many Western nations. And particularly when you take into account that their banking system is pretty secure. Um, thanks to us, we've isolated them from our problems, uh, which I don't think was quite the intention. But anyway, that's that's the effect of it. Right. Uh, and and, um, you know, I this this uh, banking crisis we face in the West is going to be um, uh, probably the most severe thing we've ever seen. I mean, it's got the potential to destroy currencies and all the rest of it. So where does that leave Russia and China? Well, you know, China is mismanaging its situation, but not to the extent that it's, um, uh, you know, going to kill the economy entirely. Russia is sitting there quite happily, 
achieving its geopolitical objectives, <laughs> is the way I put it. All right. Well, good, good answer to a challenging question. Okay. So jumping off your comment there about what you see coming has the potential to destroy currencies. Let's get to the precious metals. Um, clearly, in the macro arc that you've outlined in this, this interview here, almost all those things seem like they should be very supportive of precious metals prices going forward, because you would imagine a lot of capital, given the the arc you see happening, would be flooding into places where it could at a minimum hide from inflation or more just just try to hide from the ultimate destruction mm -hmm. of the, the economic system and currencies. Um, so I guess if you can give us sort of your latest outlook on the precious metals here, um, and maybe maybe the destruction of the currencies is something that takes years to decade plus or whatever, so it doesn't happen tomorrow. But if you could maybe also give us what you see as sort of your shorter term outlooks for the precious metals as well. And maybe in your answer too, if you can address the fact that at least for the American viewers watching here, I know that, that the price of gold has done quite well in a lot of other currencies this year, but it has been a surprising disappointment uh, to US dollar holders. Um, mm -hmm. So what, what do you see? Do you see anything that could serve as a trigger to change that? In other words, begin seeing gold appreciate in dollars as well? Yeah, there's so many answers um, to mm -hmm. this question. Take so it any way you like. <laughs> the first thing I would say is that gold is money. It is not an investment. Now, what I mean by that is that if you acquire physical gold, it must be with the intention to eventually spend it, not trade it in. This is the, this is a very important distinct, distinction. Most people, um, who, who, who buy gold in an ETF or something like that, um, uh, they, they, they view it as um, uh, a hedge maybe against um, declining, the declining situation. But essentially what they're doing is they're doing exactly the same thing they do with Bitcoin. They're looking at it, you know, I can buy gold say currently at 1736, I think it's gonna go to 2000. So I'm gonna buy it so I can sell it at 2000. You know, that is not the purpose of gold. Gold is money. It is there to be spent. And to put it, this into context, um, as J.P. Morgan himself said, and uh, I think uh, head of in, in Congress, in a speech to Congress in 1912, um, uh, money is gold and nothing else. They're, all the rest is credit. And he wasn't stating an opinion. He was stating a legal fact, which is still true today. And that is the way you've got to look at it. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we are where we are um, with a number of um, factors behind it. We have seen um, in the last few weeks, last week or so, two weeks, um, uh, various uh, senior traders on the precious metals desk at JP Morgan uh, be found guilty of criminal offences, spoofing, uh, manipulating the market. Um, we saw... Um, something which came out from um, uh, Peter Hambro, uh, who worked in um, uh, the bullion markets going back, I think, into the late 70s. Um, and uh, he stated quite clearly, and he was in the loop, and he, was, he knew all about this, uh, that uh, the Bank of International Settlements, um, you know, following the end of the Bretton Woods, um, uh, pursued a campaign um, working with major central banks to suppress the price of gold. The whole reason that uh, uh, futures markets and uh, the, the LBMA forward market evolved was to create artificial supply to take out demand for gold. And this was a point that Peter Hamber made. So <coughs> what, excuse me, what do we see today? We see um, JP Morgan and also to a lesser extent Citicorp are the two major means whereby the US government has been suppressing the price of gold. Now, I'm not saying that the price should be any different from where it is. I'm just saying that this is what has been happening. Um, if we see the suppression diminishing, and I think it might be uh, diminishing a little bit because it's not, no longer makes any sense for um, banks who have been rumbled to continue to do this to the same extent that they have in the past. They might have to find other means to quite try and sit on the price of gold. Um, I suspect that um, the outlook for gold might improve just from the point of view of that suppression uh, being diminished. 
The other problem with it, of course, is that the longer you suppress the price of gold, the more you give the opportunity to foreign central banks, particularly in Asia, to accumulate physical gold, which is what they have been doing. So actually, on many sense, on, on, in, you know, in, I mean, the original purpose of suppressing the price of gold was to allow the dollar to fulfill its void, if you like, as the reserve asset on bank balance sheets. Um, that situation has passed. So really what we're looking at now is the need to suppress gold, because if the gold price rises, it undermines credibility in the paper currencies. Um, so that's a, you know, that is a different thing. And I think that's why it has continued, but probably why it cannot continue in, 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 in a sense. So I think that's, that is, if you like, that background. Mm -hmm. um, accepting that the whole point of hoarding gold, um, physical gold, holding gold, um, is that it is money and it is to be spent. Then if you couple that with um, the regularity of banking crises and the next one coming up, which we are on the verge of, as we've uh, already discussed, is likely to be extremely severe. What I would see is crisis first, and I would see the reaction in the gold price second. I would put in a slight proviso, and that is that virtually everybody in the financial system, except perhaps the people who watch this sort of video, uh, are pure Keynesian um, uh, economists, and they're driven by macroeconomic theory. Uh, and um, they do not understand that gold actually is legal money. They do not understand the consequences of um, uh, the public rejection of a fiat currency and how that really does just remove its value entirely. They think that's something that only happens to the Venezuelans. It can't happen to the mighty dollar. Um, and they invest on that basis. So you can see that um, they are not, not going to drive the price of gold down. So the first reaction to a banking crisis is probably for money to go into the dollar and short term US government uh, paper, not gold. And we saw this indeed um, when um, uh, the Lehman uh, Brothers failed. We saw the price of gold fall. I can't remember the figures, but I think it went down from something like 830 to 680 or something like that. I mean, it was a fairly sharp fall before it then went up to 1920 um, over the next couple of years. So um, this is why you should not, you should never, ever buy physical gold as an investment because you will get whipsawed. There are people out there far bigger than you. It is a huge market. And they are on the other side of the transaction. They will shake you out. And, you know, even if you've got um, a few tens of millions of dollars to put into gold, you will get wiped out if you lo look at it as an investment. That has been the history of it. But if you have the physical stuff and you just tuck it away um, and you say, eventually, I'm going to spend this if the whole economy goes, as the Australians say, tits up, then that will be the point. <laughs> You will have you will have learned the lesson, and you will have done the right thing. <laughs> All right, um, I'm now, I'm feeling better now about my short hairs uh, swine comment <laughs> earlier. Um, all right, so um, uh, you know, in, in terms of, uh, I hate to ask this. Uh, in such a crass way, I'm going to ask you sort of about a price prediction here. Um, I don't necessarily need to get a specific number from you, but just sort of in, in thinking of, um, we're, we're going to have higher, well, based upon what we just talked about, it sounds like um, inflation is going to continue to be a concern for folks, right? And that tends to be gold supportive. Um, we may have banking crisis, like you just talked about, mm -hmm. that tends to be gold supportive after the initial drawdown, when there are margin calls and the, the, the financial you know, sort of a, a meltdown in, in, in asset prices. Um, so uh, so I'm assuming, um, I think you just said this mostly, I'm assuming you think that um, the relative value of gold is going to be higher in the future, you know, at, at certain times as, as, as the 
economic hurricane we mentioned earlier really comes into to, to, to play here. Um, I guess given where it is right now, what, what is gold? I think it, it cracked below, um, I think it's somewhere it's about, in the 1800s right now, right? Yeah, it's about 17. I mean, as we speak, it's about 1740-ish. Okay, sorry. That's right. Broke below the 1800s. So mm. it's mid-17s right now. Uh, silver, I think, is back down in the 18s. Um, maybe maybe fast forward a year or so um, into the type of future that you see coming. Um, how, how much of a delta do you see? I don't necessarily need a price target, but do you think it could be moderately higher, a lot higher, given what you see coming by then? Um, or do you think that its its day is going to take a while even longer? I know whatever path we take is going to be a volatile one. You've done a good job of warning people for that. Mm -hmm. But in terms of when it comes time for those who hold it to be able to start exchanging it, you know, for other things. Goods and services rather than yeah, currency. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and on, basis, on a basis that's relatively better than where it is today, how much are they going to benefit, do you think? An awful lot? A little? You know, just well, an awful lot, because um, if they, I mean, if, if I'm right about this, the collapse in fiat currency is going to be a lot quicker than that 10 year thing that you sort of suggested. Um, you know, this is something that is now upon us. It's not something which, uh, you know, is a in the dim and distant future, if policy continues and they manage to kick the can down the road and all that sort of stuff. No, this is, I think, a lot more immediate now. And I would see the destruction of these currencies probably within the next year to 18 months or probably two years at the outside. Um, and it could be quicker than that. Um, the, I mean, the, you can't really give a price projection as such. And this is that's something which, of course, investors love to see, you know, where do you think it's going to go? But what I can do is talk in general terms. What we will see is um, a collapse in the purchasing power of fiat currencies, obviously. Now, what that means is that, for example, the price of um, a decent house in a fashionable area, let's say, of San Francisco or Los Angeles or something like that, will obviously go up, even though the mortgages which um, uh, you know, finance these things, the interest rate on the mortgages will have risen quite substantially. But in terms of gold, you will find that the price has actually gone down. And it's a combination of uh, the scarcity of gold, physical gold, as real money being demanded as real money, will lead to a scarcity of, of um, uh, available gold driving up its purchasing power at the same time as the purchasing power of the dollar is driven down by the public's rejection of it. We saw this um, in Germany in 1923, when um, you could have bought uh, a house in a very swanky part of Berlin. Um, in 1923, you could have got that for uh, $100. Now, in those days, the dollar was exchangeable at $20.67 ounce. So we're talking about just a little less than five ounces. Now, that house today, I would expect to be the equivalent of maybe two or three million dollars something like that six bedrooms decent house you know good address etc cetera, etc cetera. major you know major city yeah i would have thought two or three million dollars something you know that's probably a fair it could even be a bit more that's five ounces of gold that gives you an idea i mean you know what it was in terms of uh paper marks at that time goodness alone knows i mean it was probably a few trillion <laughs> paper marks. But, um, you know, in terms of gold, five ounces bought you that property. Okay. Uh, and clearly that property today is worth an awful lot more ounces mm. of gold, you know, yeah. thousands or so, over a thousand ounces of gold. But you think it'll come back down to that five, five well, ounce range at some point? <clears throat> Yeah, it's 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 the economic consequences of uh, the destruction of the paper currency. Everybody has far too much paper currency. They try and get rid of it, which means its purchasing power goes down far more rapidly than the government can produce it, or it can be produced in the form of bank credit. It sort of just unties itself from that world completely. Meanwhile, the shortages of physical gold, which everybody at that stage will want, because they want to get out of 
paper. They want to get out of paper assets. I mean, just as a as as, as a, um, another point worth making. I mean, basically, in real terms, the value of property in Germany at that time just completely collapsed uh, for the very simple for the very simple reason that um, it was costing more to maintain a property than it, than you got out of rents because mm-hmm. rents always are fixed in arrears, <clears throat> as it were. You 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 know you 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 you, you set up a. Um, uh, a rental contract, yeah. say at however many thousand dollars a month, and that's that's it, and that's fixed for um, at least a year. Um, and then what happens is that um, you find that you know you got to get the plum- plumber in or whatever. The currency's collapsed. You got to pay the plumber a million dollars just to fix a tap, replace a washer, whatever. I mean, you know, do you want the property? No, you don't. You know, so you can see that. These effects are actually, if you just think about it, really quite obvious. Um, the the thing that really worries me um, more than anything else about this is that um, we all have friends, we have family who are not going to be prepared for this and um, they're going to suffer terribly. Um, and that's the aspect of it, which really frightens me. I mean, I can protect myself to a degree. Of course I can. Um, but uh, it's friends, family, it's the society, it's the links that hold us all together. That is what is going to be destroyed in this. And of course, the political consequences of all this later. It's not going to be a sudden realisation that uh, actually what we should do is we should just have sound money. Um, We should limit the amount of credit that banks issue. We'll find some way of doing that. And, you know, let's just get a stable currency and let's just get on with uh, an economy with very little government, just government making the laws, making sure that, um, you know, the, the, the nation has got reasonable defence, et cetera, rather than the ability to be offensive a- a- abroad. Um, you know, that would be wonderful if people just immediately thought of that. But then you see Hayek's road to septum and you realise that actually... It is these conditions in Germany in 1923 that eventually led to um, Hitler um, taking over the whole country and imposing his fascism on on, uh, the German nation with everything, all the ghastly things that went with it. So the political consequences of this, I'm afraid, are going to go on and on and on. And we're not necessarily, as as, um, uh, political democracies, get the right reason for why it's all gone wrong and actually uh, be sensible afterwards and, and um, return towards free markets, people standing alone, none of this woke rubbish outcome without, um, uh, you know, without long-term ramifications of starvation, energy shortages um, and everything. I mean, you know, all, all the hardships of not having a circulating medium worth, worth the candle. Yeah. All right. Well, that seems like a great stump speech for your hat being tossed in the ring for prime minister here, Alistair. So I want to let our UK <laughs> viewers know it's not too late to write you in as a candidate if they'd rather have a sound money champion there. Um, all right. Well, Alistair, look, we've got to wrap things up here. Thanks so much for giving us so much time. Um, uh, I uh, It's not lost on me that you said a few minutes ago that you think that the collapse of the major world fiat currencies will likely happen or or could happen in the next, you know, 18 plus months or so. Um, That's a very bold statement. And I wish I had more time to dig in with you on that specifically, but we'll have to do that when we bring you on next time. Um, Okay, so for folks that are uh, really enjoyed this interview, um, would be interested in learning more about you and your work, where should they go? Um, I'm published every Thursday, sort of um, late morning, early afternoon, Eastern Standard Time uh, on goldmoney.com. And there's a research tab if you hit that. Um, So I do an article every Thursday. um, And uh, the one I'm writing about at the moment, actually, which will be next Thursday, is about um, bank credit and the link to GDP and why it really matters. So that I think, uh, for people who are interested in what I've had to say, that's something that they might like to follow up on. Um, and I do a market report on precious metals, which is on the Friday. So um, that comes out about sort of late morning, early afternoon EST as well. And again, this that is on the same uh, the same front page of the research of the research side. 
Great. And you're pretty active on Twitter too, as well, right? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So um, at McLeod Finance finds me, and um, you know, hopefully, I can add something to your to your information or your education. <laughs> oh, you always <laughs> whatever. Can. And, yeah, and I, I definitely wanted to get your Twitter handle in there because I follow you and all your posts there. Um, oh, all right. So, Alistair, when we edit this, we will put up the the your Twitter handle and the links to the yeah. the Gold Money sites. Um, and, uh, and folks, uh, you know, Alistair does a great job as he has in this interview of, of really giving people the context for why owning physical precious metal is important. Um, we get lots of questions in the wake of these interviews of, okay, well, how much is right for me and in what form should I buy it in and where should I store it? Um, Alistair's company is, is a great solution for all of that. We have a free report that kind of breaks all those basic questions down for you. Uh, it's over at wealthion.com slash how to buy. So if you've got those questions, go get that free report and then go explore some of the the resources that it lists there. Um, all right, Alistair. Well, look, thank you so much. I still have a bunch of questions I didn't get to, but we we're already well over an hour in this, uh, more like an hour and 20. So we'll just have you have, have to have you back on again soon enough. Uh, thanks so much for giving us so much of your time. It's always wonderful to see you. That's very much my pleasure, Adam. Thanks for asking me on. All right. And everybody else, if you'd like to see Alistair back on, as well as other great guests of his caliber, please do us a favor and support this channel by hitting the like button and then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Thanks so much again, Alistair. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.